where we have one of Richard's interests, um, great interests, was on this potato garden that's been maintained in their family on Mark's Trail for generations. And I'm very interested in hearing about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, mention all the all the people that are gonna be talking um, on it, and then you guys will find your um, your order of speakers. Um, so we have Elizabeth Kunibe. Kunibe, thank you, Elizabeth Kunibe. Uh, she's a, a wood carver and was adopted by the Kiksadi clan. So for her work uh, with the children. She learned about Clinket Gardens, and um, this began her collaboration with Dick and Nora Dallenhauer and Tannis H. Pin. So they, I remember them talking about it in class. I mean, so this is gonna be really neat. I think this is a unique um, type of potato, you know, that they, that they preserve. So, and we also have Tannis Maria H. Pin, She's of the Kutnafadi clan, Yai Hit Whale House from Yakutat. She's Irish too. She's a visual artist. I mean, I think her, her work is very um, cutting edge, very um, you know, visceral, has political um, uh, questions that it raises. It's very, very powerful. And it's, it's collected in uh, museums across the country. She's exhibited in US and Canada. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree at, the, at UAF, master's degree at um, UA, uh, University of uh, Arizona, Tucson, and is an associate professor at Fairhaven College, Western Washington University, Bellingham, Washington. So I'm um, excited to hear from her. Um, and we also have uh, Kathy Ruddy, who's going to help uh, introduce the family um, that's here. So Kathy. You know, she she's a special person. Uh, where is she? She's um, she, bringing up the grandchildren and the great grandchildren yeah. who planted and dug potatoes. That's the end. All right. So Kathy uh, was adopted into the Dixon uh, clan, and she set up that uh, Cyril George, um, you know, uh, showing of of the photos of his photos. She has been, you know, she's not often up front. She's behind the scenes, but we all notice her uh, tireless um, work helping out um, our families, helping out our community. Um, so it's, it's, it's special um, to see people like Kathy who's, who's out there doing that kind of work. So, okay, so I'll turn it over to you guys and we'll have this discussion. Okay, can yeah. we get a, we get a uh, front light? I think this probably help, would be best. Uh, okay, maybe it's, uh, there we go. Could it change? I think, yeah, front light is usually how we do it. Okay. Can we get up there and turn the seat around here? Can we turn the seat out for you? Okay. And the title of this is Maria's Plank and Potato. Maybe some of you have heard about it. We've been talking about it for a long time. And it's the journey to the Dallenhauer's Garden. So the potato was first given to Nora and Dick by Maria Miller, and her daughter here is Pants. So that's where the journey starts and came. But after studies, it turns out that it was actually from South America. So we've gone through it um, like the genetic family tree of this. And one of the important things about it is, you know, food represents seed. So you can't go to the store to buy these potatoes. You have to keep them. And Maria kept them for generations, and so did Dick. And every spring, Dick would get phone calls from everybody like, oh, I ate them all, or I don't have any left, could I have another batch? So he also had that um, realization of how important these were And here's the, the garden 
here on the left in Glacier Bay. And I couldn't understand how there could be a garden there. Because 200 years ago, the whole, the whole bay was filled with ice. So to have a garden that was 100 years old in Glacier Bay was very interesting. And it had, it had really high mounds. And at first, you know, we even questioned it if it was a garden. And we toured <coughs> the trees, and the trees were about 80 years old. And then the other photograph is a woman who's digging up her potatoes that look very similar to Maria's. The location of this wasn't given, so we, we don't know exactly where that was, but it gives you the idea of the potato crop and how she's using her digging stick. And then after we realized this garden is here and started looking deeper, this photograph, this uh, drawing by Oral Krauss in 1850, shows women in Huna planting. And you can see this just is in a little garden out behind your uh, kitchen. You know, this is a big field. And they, again, have the digging sticks. And here's a copy of a digging stick. Or here is the photo of the digging stick that the museum has that shows the flattened down, um, like a spike that was in, turned into this. And then everybody says, oh, we'll put seaweed on your garden. You know, and a lot of people do that here in the community garden. And this just shows you the volume. This is in Kodiak. And it shows you the vol volume of somebody putting the seaweed uh, down in the garden patch, and how much they actually put in there. And also, they had many gardens there, but then after the eruption, then the, they stopped gardening. And they have a lake there, too, called Potato Lake. And here's the differences in indigenous agriculture and non-indigenous, you know, most indigenous agroecology, agroecology, which agroecology means growing within your ecosystem. Like many of the Tlingit gardens that we started to realize were all over southeast Alaska, were right on the sunny southern shore of a lot of the islands and were always traveled to by canoe and um, I had said to my friend, uh, did your grandmother have a garden? You know, I'm already putting it in my, the gender label. And he, he just laughed at me and he said, my grandfather had three. <laughs> Jeff David's son in um, Haines, his, his father had, his grandfather had three gardens. And then we get to when I first met Dick, his grandson told me that his, so I was interested in the, um, the gardens in Glacier Bay, and then his grandson said, my grandfather grows this old potato. I didn't really even care. I was like, oh well, six months go by. He kept bugging me to call his grandparents. And so I said, okay, who's your grandparents? And he goes, Richard and Nora Downhauer. So I called up Professor Downhauer and I said, you know, I know you were the poet laureate of the state, and you're the <laughs> professor of linguistics at the university. But I also hear you're growing this potato that was old. So that's how we began on this. And so you'll see the Glacier Bay Garden. And then here's um, Dick here with Chuck Brown, who's the geneticist that worked on the uh, Maria's potato. And then there's also another one that Julie Coburn had in Kassan that we collected. And that shows there by the red wall, that's how many are left. You know, she plants a few each year. It's because it's pretty hard to keep them going. Here's just a close up of uh, the g geneticist, Chuck Brown and Dick and myself and my daughter. So we started to realize these potatoes had to come from somewhere. So there's actually two primitive cultivated potatoes. Going back to the word primitive that Will talked about, what that means is they weren't bred and um, not genetically altered, but potatoes are bred to each other through the flowers. So what makes it have a, a primitive, they call it, is a lot of eyes, a lot of flowers on the plant. They weren't bred for high yield like most of the potatoes that we have here. Then here's just the genetic um, comparison. So the Ozette potato is grown by the Macaw Nation on the Olympic Peninsula. And that's called the Native American potato. 
and then the Toliak is drawn by the Quili, drawn by the Quili Nation, also on the Olympic Peninsula, and then Maria's potato, which was from Haine, and then the Johnny Gunther isn't a Native American potato in the Kasane. So there's four Native American potatoes, and the National Science Foundation couldn't believe two of them were from Alaska. There's nowhere other no other Native group is growing these kinds of varieties anywhere in the U.S. So. And then there's people that are potato trackers. So <laughs> here's, here's Alberto Salas in taxonomist David Spooner. And what they do is they travel all over the world, including Chuck Brown has done this. He spent 10 years just living in South America. And they go by horseback and collect all these potato varieties. And then they compare the genetic studies of that potato variety using the plant leaves. Wow. And, and David Spooner, one of the, uh, his young students, decided it would be a good idea to travel around the world and collect potato um, leaves from these herbariums. And so some of the plants she collected were almost 400 years old. And then she devised how to, it, to extract the DNA from them. And it turns out that the first potatoes in the leaving South America went to the Canary Islands and then spread through Europe. So here's just the DNA analysis. So the potato Maria's was not grown in Europe. It doesn't have any European markers. So it was never grown in Europe. And it didn't, a lot of people thought those settlers brought it here from Europe and that didn't happen. So it could have come up with explorers. Um, we, we know the Russians didn't bring it here from Russia, but, but some of them did go around South America. And here's just a side view of the, it's just like an ancestral tree or a chart. In the very center, you'll see the rare, how the, the Native American potatoes are only slightly related. And two growthums are from Chile, which makes sense because the Andagina are from the Andes and we're sea level. So that type of potato grows much better here. And so we're thinking that's the ones that are still here. And it, of course, the DNA proved that they were. And then here's just a map where you can see Kirill Klebnikov, Klebnikov went around Chile. Mm. And he bought grapes from there to, of course, California's wine country, where he keeps a track of it in his journal. And they, he kept checking them for seven years. You know, he, was, he liked the way his grapes were going. So these explorers were also coming up here from South America, bringing um, plants. And then here's Chuck Brown, who's breeding some potatoes. He looks like the mad scientist. <laughs> and then Roy Navarre, a biochemist. So what they did is they said, well, nobody's really ever studied what's in a potato other than like an Idaho baker. <laughs> so, it, so the potato is just like, yeah, it's just full of carbohydrates and it's no good for you. So they tested 150 varieties and came up with all sorts of high nutritious um, phytonutrients that were in these potatoes. And of course, the, potato, the purple potatoes and the colored potatoes have more phytonutrients than the white ones. And you can see the varieties in front of them of all the different colors. And you can see here the primitive potatoes with all the eyes and the weird shapes don't look anything like these other potatoes with no eyes. So the ones with no eyes are very hard to keep planting each year because that's where your sprout comes from. And potatoes are clones of each other. So that's how you can trace it back 200 years. And then here's just some of the centers after they cut them open. And then here you can see Southeast Alaska, and it shows that there was refugia where canoes, people could travel. So the possibility is, you know, the explorers didn't bring them, but maybe, you know, it's pretty easy to put some of these tiny potatoes in a bag and bring them here. And that's what happened to Julie Coburn's, her great aunt canoed, her and her girlfriend <laughs> canoed down to Seattle by themselves, you know, and brought back some potatoes with them. And those were the Kassan. And then here's just some people in South America. 
and planting. And then it, it goes the biodiversity of these potatoes. Each one has different phytonutrient levels instead of just a big bunch of white potatoes. So color is always good. And this is a, in the Quechua language. So they also gave their potatoes these beautiful names. You know, shining butterfly, peaceful heart, happy heart, midnight passion. And a lot of farmers there will be growing 15 to 20 varieties. And here's a ceremony for potato planting, and then some potato art. And then down below, you know, I was talking about traditional ecological knowledge, and it comes from, it's coming back because people don't like using the fertilizers. There's not a lot of water there to, to even wash with. So sometimes these things get carried back into your house, and children get sick, and people get sick. So they're mixing up a batch of their home brew that they put on the plant, as opposed to the guy with the mask on spraying. And this is, then, now I'm just going to show some children. This is in South America. She, the little children there have, have machetes. <laughs> and she's, she's scraping a uh, sugar cane that, you know, she cut up and we all kind of chewed on it. And those are cocoa pods in the back. So this is their, their farming, their agriculture. She lives right on this property with her family. And here's the little girl, Tai, who's, this is manioc that she's, looking through. And some of the gardens there have 45 different varieties of manioc. So that, that was why I put that sentence in there, how we regard the biodiversity, because if you go to the store, you either buy a baker or, or a french fry type of potato. And then this is in Haine. This is the garden that is now revived after about 90 years. It's in front of their old school. And this is their bounty from the garden. You can see how all the stuff is just healthy and beautiful. And then here's today, they were planting Maria's potatoes, Marsha Hotch and I, a little potato workshop over there, and brought mm -hmm. potatoes. And so it's replanted right in that same place that it was. And now we get to the <laughs> to Richard's family. <laughs> Richard wasn't the only farmer, you know. This is his, this is the, one of his um, great grandsons, probably. They were totally fascinated with the worms and the potatoes. So this was just this recent, um, picking this recent harvest a couple months ago. And here, she's, she's really working in the, in the dirt here, and she's got like, little potatoes in her hand. <laughs> we were digging them all up. <laughs> and then what we did is put the seaweed on the garden and put a little plot of garlic in there, too, because Nora likes garlic and bedded them down for the winter. And then that's Richard's pitchfork, which is still used because that's the best way to harvest them. And here he is with Professor Gearlock, another farmer. And these two professors just, you know, love farming and plants and food, and that's their work. And that's the end. And who would have thought a potato would bring them home? <laughs> This is the woman behind the potato, Maria Ackerman Miller, and her Twicket name, Lenate, if I'm saying it right, of um, the Raven Argy, Moati, Lukmikadi, Koho Clan, and Whale House out of Yakutak. So this is a picture of her from 19, early 1980s, and we happened to go to the beach one day, and um, she just was always working with her hands, always busy, always curious, and never still. So at this point, she was sitting at the beach, looking at beach grass, trying to figure out how she could make a basket. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, 
my mother was born in 1927 in Juneau and passed away in 1995. But um, her life was really full. And like I said, she was, um, you know, it's, I'm getting so emotional. <laughs> but um, she was constantly busy. She was proud of her cultural heritage and never denied the fact that um, she came from a culture that was real rich in the arts. And from an early, early age, she learned how to sew with um, furs and leather and do beadwork. And thanks to her aunt, Jessie Jacobs, who took her out of the Catholic mission in Skagway and took her home to Haines, taught her how to do uh, traditional foods and traditional sewing. So um, in uh, the, let's see, in 19, I think it was 1950, 1959, no, 1950, what was it? Oh, maybe 1963, we, we moved to the interior of Alaska, and there she was able to um, sew moccasins and parkas and things like that and sell them to the military because we were living in the interior where it was really cold, so she was able to do very well selling um, garments to uh, the military there, which really supplemented our income. And then uh, she moved to Anchorage in the early 1970s and really became involved in the public school district and moved from doing her traditional skin work to um, making blankets. She was really interested in doing weaving and thought that that was something that she was meant to do her whole life. And she talked about uh, when she was a young child how she was uh, would go to Club One and visit with Jenny Clanat to learn how to weave, but uh, that had never happened. And so while she was in Anchorage in, um, I think it was in the early 80s, Nathan Jackson's uh, wife, Dorica Jackson, gave her a two-week crash course lesson on weaving, and she took it from there, and eventually became known as the master, a master chillcat weaver. And she did her work as well at the Visual Arts Center, and there she worked with um, James Shofford and other really well-known Alaska Native artists. And in 1975, she wrote um, a book called Clinket Stories, where she gathered stories from Klukwan and interviewed the elders, and I helped her to illustrate it. So I think it's, it's a fairly well-known book to this day. And she was also recognized as a national um, living treasure, and this was in uh, the, the 1980s in Anchorage. And she also was able to um, sell a blanket to the Anchorage uh, School District, and it was through the 1% for the Arts program. And, and she just recently, or it was just recently, rededicated in Anchorage and was danced for the first time. So these are the potatoes, the famous potatoes, and um, this is uh, the potatoes in Clinket, Quince, and I asked Dick how, how to spell it, so I'm, pre uh, I'm pleased that he was able to provide me with that. So I wanted to trace a little bit uh, the potatoes and what I know of them, and this is pretty interesting because she planted them in Haynes, and this was after the majority of us had left home, the children had left home. So when we would go back to visit mom, she would send us to the garden to pick the potatoes and harvest just a few of them for soup or whatever we were eating at the time. And it, was, it didn't seem like it was um, a major deal for any of us. It was just something that she did because she was so interested in doing a wide variety of things. So we would go to the garden and collect these little potatoes for, for dinner. And so in looking at the history of, of the potatoes, as far as I know, they came from Kassan. I have been invited to share an unpublished poem written by Dick. It's called Harvesting Potatoes, so I feel really honored to do this. Harvesting Potatoes, nondescript, the autumn of our lives, a kinglet, basking in the spruce top in fading sun, juncos flashier, more energetic. In my rusty garden chair, I rest from harvesting potatoes. This, crispy, this crisp summer day, savoring the sunlight after weeks of steady, unrelenting rain, communion of sorts in the churned potato bed, 
all those upright stems of summer fallen falling of their age and weight our faith is cold of bounty more obscure beneath